Hi, today we're going to be talking about section 1.4 and that's membrane transport. There's some things that we need to know in this module and that's that particles move across membranes by simple diffusion, by facilitated diffusion, osmosis, and active transport. So there's a variety of ways we can get things in and out of the cell. And the fluidity of the membrane allows for these materials to be taken into cells by endocytosis or released from the cells by exocytosis. And it's important to note that we have uh, these membrane bound vesicles that are moving materials within the cells. And then one of the things that we need to know how to do is to estimate the osmolarity of the tissues um, that we bathe in some samples of either hypotonic or hypertonic solutions. So this is a lab that we probably did in class. So diffusion is uh, the passive movement of a substance in uh, some sort of a medium. So here you can see, uh, for instance, we're dropping a sugar cube into some water and then over time it's going to dissolve. It's got some dye associated with it. It's going to dissolve and then passively um, spread its way out. Uh, and color the entire liquid um, that we've dropped it in. So that's diffusion. And um, they'll diffuse, you know, just throughout a medium or back and forth across a particular membrane, provided that the membrane is permeable to the substance. Um, and as long as there's a concentration difference on either side of the membrane uh, and that it can pass through the membrane, it'll do so until it reaches the point of equilibrium. So osmosis is just simply the diffusion of water across a selectively permeable membrane. And if we look at this U-tube right here, we can see that it's got a semi-permeable membrane here and it allows the water to move, but not all of the particles. So you can see that these, these uh, um, there's more concentrated solution, I guess we could say on this side. And so the water, which is represented in these blue dots is gonna move across the membrane until it reaches the point of equilibrium. And in doing so, we might get an actual you know, difference in the height in the two columns. And if we were to apply a pressure to this, this is the osmotic pressure that we're talking about. If we apply a pressure in the downward direction here, we can prevent the movement. Or if we pressed hard enough, we could actually force the water from here over into this side. And then we can see with these examples of uh, uh, biological examples here with these red blood cells, if we're in um, different concentrations of uh, solution, we can see that different things are actually going to happen. But before we talk more about that, there's a few terms that we need to know uh, regarding the, the uh, movement of these substances. And one is tonicity, and that describes the solution's ability to gain or lose water. Um, we can have hypertonic and hypotonic, and these are relative terms, and they're just used to compare um, the, the concentrations of two different solutions we might be talking about, whereas a hypotonic has a lower solute concentration relative to the other one, and a hypertonic solution is one that has a higher concentration of solute molecules relative to the one that we're discussing. And if the two solutions that we're talking about are equal, then we say that they're actually isotonic. They have this, the same tonicity. So back to the biological example of the cells. If we're looking at uh, dropping uh, um, these cells in these different concentrations of solutions here, we can see that if we have a hypotonic solution, that is the, the surroundings contain more water or less solutes than either of these two cells, for instance, um, water is going to move down its gradient in, in an attempt to e uh, equilibrate itself. And therefore, since the red blood cell doesn't have any cell wall, the cell is going to burst. Whereas in the, the case of the plant cell, we'd say that the cell is going to be turgid. It'll take up the water. It's going to be firm. It's going to have a healthy appearance, etc. Um, if we're in a hypertonic environment, this is where there is... Um, more uh, dissolved solutes on the outside uh, relative to the cytoplasm, then the water is going to move out again down its gradient in an attempt to reach equilibrium, and therefore the cell is going to shrivel up. In this case, there's uh, the cell wall isn't much help. These cells will still lose water, and they we say that they're plasmalized, um, and they start to pull away from the cell wall. And then if we place them in an isotonic solution, now we can see that uh, uh, this is a state of equilibrium. The amount of water moving into the cell is equal to the amount of water moving out of the cell. And in, in the case of plants, they want to be turgid. They want to have, um, you know, or be in you know, somewhat of a watery environment so that they can uh, take water into their cells. Whereas if they're in a state of equilibrium, they're going to be flaccid. And uh, in this case over here, they were, they're also flaccid, but uh, at the point of equilibrium, um, the plant cell would uh, be said to be flaccid. 
So as far as diffusion is going, um, sometimes we're asked about facilitated diffusion. And it's important to note that this is actually a passive process. And we want to focus on the word diffusion here, diffusion being a, a passive process. And in this case, there's just a protein that's going to facilitate the movement of a substance back and forth across the membrane. But it's diffusion and it's passive. There's two types of facilitated diffusion. One of them involves a carrier protein, like you see here, that's going to change shape and allow these molecules to move into the cell. Um, but again, it's passive process. It's just resulting in a shape change of the, the protein. And then um, the other type is just a, a simple transport molecule where these molecules or these ions, whatever it is, can move back and forth across the membrane kind of uh, at will, just depending on the concentration gradient. We have uniporters, symporters, and antiporters. And with the uniporter, what it's going to do is it's going to move one substance back and forth across the membrane. Whereas an antiporter is going to exchange two different substances across the membrane and a symporter is going to move two substances across the membrane at the same time. So with active transport now, this is the process that involves ATP energy and actually using energy to move substances back and forth across the membrane. And one of the um, you know, kind of classic examples of this is a sodium potassium pump. And in this process here, you can see that we're going to hydrolyze or break down some ATP energy and we're going to move three sodiums out of the cell and we're going to move two potassiums in. And this is important in things like nerve uh, function, transmission of an action potential, things like that, because we're building up an ion gradient and we're, we're not only do we have the more sodiums on the outside relative to the inside of the membrane, there's more potassiums inside relative to the outside, but it's a three for two exchange. So what we're going to get is a charge difference built up as well, whereas the outside is going to be more positive or the inside is going to be more negative relative to the outside. And and so we have a concentration difference as well as an electrical difference, and that's going to set up in a gradient that's going to allow us to do certain things like transmit a nerve signal. So co-transport now, this is another example of an active transport. It's an active process because what it involves is the hydrolysis of this ATP energy, and we're going to use ATP to move a substance against its concentration gradient. In other words, we're going to move these hydrogens out across the membrane with a protein pump, and we're going to build up their concentration on the outside of the membrane. So in doing so, we've burned some energy, that's why it's an active process, but as these hydrogen ions then move down their concentration gradient through this co-transport molecule, or protein here, it's going to bring these sucrose molecules in with it. So this is a case where as the hydrogen moves down its concentration gradient, the sucrose is going to come with it, but because we're burning some ATP energy here, this is uh, going to be an active process. So. Now, moving on to the membrane uh, fluidity, um, the, the, we talked in the last module about the uh, fluid mosaic model and how the membrane is always kind of moving around. It's not this rigid um, kind of static uh, structure. It's, it's always moving. And one of the um, kind of useful features of that is that um, we can bring things in or remove things from the cell, get things out of the cell through the process of endocytosis or exocytosis. And what endocytosis does, as you can see here, is it's going to somehow bring something in. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. And exocytosis is kind of putting things out of the cell. And in both instances, you can see we've talked about earlier the movement of substances within the cell using these vesicles. So with endocytosis, there's three things we need to know. We have phagocytosis, we have pinocytosis, and we have receptor-mediated endocytosis. So with phagocytosis, this is cell eating, more or less, and it's a way that the cell takes in solid particles from its cells. So an amoeba would be something that would do this, um, and, and the cell in general can. And what happens is, is you get this invagination or this pinching in of the cell membrane with the... Uh, um, things on the exterior that it's going to bring in, and it's going to form this uh, um, food vacuole that it's going to then fuse with a, a, a lysosome or something like that, but it's going to um, digest and break down whatever it's brought in. And you can see here, here's an amoeba bringing in a food particle, and it's wrapping its pseudopods around, it's going to bring it in, and it's going to use this as uh, a food source. With pinocytosis now, this is cell drinking, and what we're basically doing is bringing in liquids and small solute particles. So again, you have this invagination or this pinching in of the uh, cell membrane, and it's bringing these substances in. And again, there's your vesicle that's going to be transported to um, a lysosome, breaking things down, and then making it useful again for the cell. 
And then with receptor-mediated endocytosis, what we have here is we have certain substances on the exterior of the cell that are going to bind with receptor proteins in the membrane. And when this occurs, you're going to get a pinching in or an invagination again, and you're going to form this vesicle. And this vesicle is going to fuse with a lysosome, or in this case what it's called is an endosome. And then it's going to send it to a lysosome, and it's regenerating as these particles uh, drop off their cargo. They're going to kind of be regenerated and put back into the membrane. So it's kind of a cyclical way of, of doing things. And in this example, what we have... Uh, uh, the commonly referred to when I teach my students is just how cholesterol is metabolized from the uh, cell and a lot was learned about this process when they were understanding what causes uh, um, high blood cholesterol levels. So if this is a cholesterol molecule it's going to bind with this clathrin molecule in the membrane be brought in again through this vesicle and metabolized um, appropriately and people who have high cholesterol or, or have some sort of a mutation usually in the, the gene that allows these receptor proteins to be made and therefore none of this cholesterol gets in, it remains in their um, blood and their blood serum cholesterol levels are often very high. So this is receptor mediated endocytosis whereby again the, the substance in the blood is going to bind with the receptor before being brought into the cell. And then exocytosis, this is the, the, the opposite process of bringing things in. Exocytosis is getting things out. And again, oftentimes you'll uh, run from um, the, the rough ER through the Golgi to form these vesicles. And then these vesicles are going to you know, have a variety of types of, of uh, uh, compounds in them. And it's going to fuse with the membrane and kind of spill their contents out into um, the surroundings where they're either going to be uh, transported to other areas of the body or have an effect on neighboring cells or something like that and that would be the process of exocytosis. Now the last thing we want to talk about here is one of the things that we learned about when we were doing the labs and in, in my classes we used potato cells and you can measure a mass difference, you can measure a, a uh, change in the length of, of certain things, um, but what we did basically was is we, we took some potato cells and we bathed them in a variety of different uh, um, sucrose solutions of varying concentrations. And you can see here, we've got some data. Here's some concentration that we used. Um, you can use any uh, of different kinds of concentrations. And then here you uh, have the change in length in this particular example. And when you look, here's the, the, the x-axis. This is the zero mark. And the important point in this is when we build this graph and we put our line of best fit in, um, we've got our change of length over here and our concentration there. And the point, the zero point right here, this spot where the, the line crosses the x-axis, that's where there's zero change in length or zero change in mass, and that zero change is what you can use to estimate the approximate concentration of the uh, cytoplasm of the cell because that would be the point of equilibrium. That's where the amount of, of water coming in is equal to the amount of water going out, and then you can use that number um, for a variety of different purposes, calculations, things like that. But uh, this zero point right here is, is the important part of this particular lab that we did. Okay, so I hope this helped, and uh, good luck.